stepfather so excited that he can hardly wait. He plans to marry Marlow off to my sister Kate. My mother's madly hoping I'll wed my cousin Khan. My cousin Khan is moping, much more of that anon. These two are all confusion, they think they're at an inn. I helped in that delusion, now let the fun begin. To me, a modest woman, dressed out in all her finery, is the most tremendous object of the whole creation. <laughs> this great man, how can you ever expect to marry? Never. Unless, as among kings and princes, my bride were to be courted by proxy, if indeed, like an Eastern bridegroom, one were to be introduced to a wife he never saw before, it might be endured. But to go through all the terrors of a formal courtship, together with the episodes of aunts, grandmothers and cousins, and at last to blurt out the broad staring question of, Madam, will you marry me? No, no. That's a strain much above me, I assure you. I pity you. But... How do you intend behaving to the lady you are come down to visit at the request of your father? As I behave to all other ladies. Bow very low, answer yes or no to all her demands. But for the rest, I don't think I shall venture to look in her face till I see my father's again. I'm surprised that one who is so warm a friend can be so cool a lover. To be explicit, my dear Hastings, my chief inducement down was to be instrumental in forwarding your happiness, not my own. Miss Neville loves you. The family don't know you. As my friend, you are sure of a reception. Let honour do the rest. My dear Marlowe. <clears throat> but I'll suppress the emotion. Were I a wretch, meanly seeking to carry off a fortune, you should be the last man in the world I would apply to for assistance. But Miss Neville's person is all I ask. And that is mine, both from her deceased father's consent and her own inclination. Happy man. You have talents and art to captivate any woman. I'm doomed to adore the sex and yet to converse with the only part of it I despise. This stammer in my address and this awkward prepossessing visage of mine can never permit me to soar above the reach of a milliner's apprentice or one of the duchesses of Drury Lane. Oh, sure, there's a fellow here to interrupt us. Gentlemen, once more you are welcome. Which is Mr. Marlowe? Sir, you are heartily welcome. It's not my way, you see, to receive my friends with my back to the fire. I like to give them a hearty reception in the old style at my gate. I like to see their horses and trunks taken care of. He's got our names from the servants already. We approve your caution and hospitality, sir. I've been thinking, George, of changing our travelling dresses in the morning. I'm grown confoundedly ashamed of mine. I beg, Mr. Marlowe, you'll use no ceremony in this house. I fancy, Charles, you're right. The first blow is half the battle. I intend opening the campaign with the white and gold. Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Hastings, gentlemen, pray be under no constraint in this house. This is Liberty Hall, gentlemen. You may do just as you please here. Yet... George, if we open the campaign too fiercely at first, we may want ammunition before it is over. I think to reserve the embroidery to secure a retreat. You're talking of retreat, Mr. Marlowe. Puts me in mind of the Duke of Marlborough when we went to besiege Denain. He first summoned the garrison. Don't you think the Ventredor waistcoat will do with the plain brown? He first summoned the garrison, which might consist of about 5,000 men. I think not. Brown and yellow mix, but very poorly. I say, gentlemen, as I was telling you, he summoned the garrison, which might consist of about 5,000 men. The girls like finery. Which might consist of about 5,000 men. Well appointed with stores and ammunition and other implements of war. Now, says the Duke of Marlborough to George Brooks that stood next to him. You, you must have heard of George Brooks. I'll pawn my dukedom, says he, but I'll take that garrison without spilling a drop of blood. So... What, my good friend, if you gave us a glass of punch in the meantime, it would help us to carry on the siege with vigour. Punch, sir? This is the most unaccountable kind of modesty I've ever met with. Yes, sir, punch. A glass of warm punch after our journey would be comfortable. 
This is Liberty Hall, you know. Wait, well, here's a cup, sir. Sir, this fellow in his Liberty Hall will only let us have just what he pleases. <laughs> I hope you find it to your mind. I prepared it with my own hands. I believe your own, the ingredients are tolerable. Will you be so good as to pledge me, sir? Here, Mr. Marlowe. Here is to our better acquaintance. A very impudent fellow, this, but he's a character, and I'll humour him a little. Sir, my service to you. I see this fellow wants to give us his company and forgets that he's an innkeeper before he's learnt to be a gentleman. Hmm. From the excellence of your cup, my old friend, I suppose you must have a good deal of business in this part of the country. Warm work now and then at elections, I suppose. Oh, no, sir, I've long given that work over. Since our betters have hit upon the expedient of electing each other, <laughs> there's no business for us that sell ale. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have no turn for politics, I find. Not in the least. There was a time, indeed, when I fretted myself about the mistakes of government like other people, but finding myself every day grow more angry and the government growing no better, I left it to mend itself. Since that time, I no more trouble my head about Hyder Ali or Ali Corn than I do about Ali Croker. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, my service to you. So that with eating above stairs and drinking below, with receiving your friends within and amusing them without, you lead a good, pleasant, bustling life of it. I do stir about a good deal, that's certain. <laughs> Half the differences of the parish are adjusted in this very parlour. And you have an argument in your cup, old gentleman, better than any in Westminster Hall. I, young gentleman, that and a little philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the first time I've ever heard of an innkeeper's philosophy. So then, like an experienced general, you attack them on every quarter. If you find their reason manageable, you attack it with your philosophy. If you find they have no reason, you attack them with this. Here's your health, my philosopher. <laughs> very good, very good, thank you, yeah. Your generalship puts me in mind of Prince Eugene when we fought the Turks at the Battle of Belgrade. You shall hear. Instead of the Battle of Belgrade, I believe it's almost time to talk about supper. What has your philosophy got in the house for supper? For supper, sir? Was ever such a request made to a man in his own house? Yes, sir. Supper, sir. I begin to feel an appetite. I shall make devilish work tonight in the larder, I promise you. Such a brazen dog sure never my eyes beheld. Well, really, sir, as for supper, I can't well tell. My, my Dorothy and the cookmaid settled these things between them. Uh, I leave these kind of things entirely to them. You do, do you? Entirely. By the by, I believe they are in actual consultation upon what's for supper this very moment in the kitchen. Then I beg they'll admit me as one of their privy council. It's a way I have got. When I travel, I always choose to regulate my own supper. Let the cook be called. No offence, I hope, sir. Oh, no, sir. None in the least. Yet I don't know how. Uh, our Bridget, the cookmaid, is not very communicative upon these occasions. <laughs> Should we send for her, she might scold us all out of the house. <laughs> Let's see your list of the larder, then. I ask it as a favour. I always match my appetite to my bill of fare. Sir, he's very right, and it's my way, too. Uh, sirs, you have a right to command here. Roger, uh, bring us the bill of fare for tonight's supper. I believe it's drawn out. Your manner, Mr. Hastings, puts me in mind of my uncle, Colonel Wallop. It was a saying of his that no man was sure of his supper till he had eaten it. <laughs> it's all upon the high ropes. His uncle, a colonel. We shall soon hear of his mother being a justice of the peace. But let's hear the bill of fare. Well, what's here? For the first course, for the second course, for the dessert. The devil, sir, do you think we've brought down the whole joiners company? Or the Corporation of Bedford to eat up such a supper? <coughs> Two or three little things, clean and comfortable, will do. Uh, but let's hear it. Hmm, for the first course, at the top, a pig and prune sauce. <laughs> uh, damn your pig, I say. And damn your prune sauce, say I. And yet, gentlemen, to men that are hungry, a pig with prune sauce is very good eating. <laughs> at the bottom, a calf's tongue and brains. Let your brains be knocked out, my good sir. I don't like them. Or you may clap them on a plate by themselves, I do. Their impudence confounds me. Gentlemen, you are my guests. Make what alterations you please. 
Is there anything else you wish to retrench or alter, gentlemen? A pork pie, a boiled rabbit and sausages, a Florentine, a shaking pudding, and a dish of tiff taff taffety cream. Confound your made dishes. I shall be as much at a loss in this house as at a green and yellow dinner at the French ambassador's table. I'm for plain eating. Well, I'm sorry, gentlemen, that I have nothing you like. Uh, but if there be anything you have a particular fancy to... Uh... Why, really, sir, your bill of fare is so exquisite that any one part of it is full as good as another. Send us what you please. So much for supper. And now to see that our beds are aired and properly taken care of. I entreat you'll leave all that to me. You shall not stir a step. I leave that to you. I protest, sir, you must excuse me. I always look to these things myself. But I must insist, sir, you'll make yourself easy on that head. You see, I'm resolved on it. <laughs> A very troublesome fellow this as I ever met with. Well, I'm resolved at least to attend you. This may be modern modesty, but I never saw anything look so like old-fashioned impudence. So I find this fellow's civilities begin to grow troublesome. But who can be angry at those assiduities which are meant to please him? Miss Neville! By all that's happy. My dear Hastings, to what unexpected good fortune? To what accident am I to ascribe this happy meeting? Rather let me ask the same question, as I could never have hoped to meet my dearest Constance at an inn. An inn? I'm sure you mistake. My aunt, my guardian lives here. What could induce you to think this house an inn? My friend, Mr. Marlowe, with whom I came down, and I, have been sent here as to an inn. I assure you, a young fellow whom we accidentally met at a house hard by directed us hither. <laughs> Certainly it must be one of my hopeful cousin's tricks, of whom you have heard me talk so often. <laughs> he whom your aunt intends for you. He of whom I have such just apprehensions. You have nothing to fear from him, I assure you. You'd adore him if you knew how heartily he despises me. My aunt knows it too, and has undertaken to court me for him, and actually begins to think she has made a conquest. Thou dear dissembler, you must know my Constance. I have just seized this happy opportunity of my friend's visit here to get admittance into the family. The horses that carried us down are now fatigued with their journey, but they'll soon be refreshed. And then, if my dearest girl will trust in her faithful Hastings, we shall soon be landed in France where even among slaves, the laws of marriage are respected. I have often told you that though ready to obey you, I yet should leave my little fortune behind with reluctance. The greatest part of it was left by my uncle, the India director, and chiefly consists in jewels. I have been for some time persuading my aunt to let me wear them. I fancy I'm very near succeeding. The instant they are put into my possession, you shall find me ready to make them, and myself, yours. Perish the baubles. Your person is all I desire. In the meantime, my friend Marlow must not be let into his mistake. I know the strange reserve of his temper is such that if abruptly informed of it, he would instantly quit the house before our plan was ripe for execution. But how shall we keep him in the deception? Miss Hardcastle is just returned from walking. What if we still continue to deceive him? This way. The assiduities of these good people tease me beyond bearing. My host seems to think it ill manners to leave me alone. <laughs> so he claps not only himself, but his old-fashioned wife on my back. They talk of coming to sup with us too. And then I suppose we are to run the gauntlet through all the rest of the family. What have we got here? My dear Charles, let me congratulate you. The most fortunate accident. Who do you think is just delighted? Cannot guess. Our mistress's boy, Miss Hardcastle and Miss Neville. Uh, give me leave to introduce Miss Constance Neville to your acquaintance. Happening to dine in the neighborhood, they called on their return to take fresh horses here. Miss Hardcastle has just stepped inside and will be back in an instant. Wasn't it lucky, eh? I have just been mortified enough of all conscience, and here comes something to complete my embarrassment. Well, wasn't it the most fortunate thing in the world? Oh, 
Yes, very fortunate, a most joyful encounter. But our dresses, George, you know, are in disorder. What if we should postpone the happiness till tomorrow? Tomorrow at her own house. It will be every bit as convenient and rather more respectful. Tomorrow, let it be. By no means, sir. Your ceremony will displease her. The disorder of your dress will show the ardor of your impatience. Besides, she knows you're in the house and will permit you to see her. Oh, the devil. How shall I support it? Hastings, you must not go. You are to assist me, you know? I shall be confoundedly ridiculous. Yet, hang it. I'll take courage. <clears throat> For sure, man. It's but the first plunge and all's over. She's but a woman, you know. And of all women, she that I dread most to encounter. Miss Hardcastle, Mr. Marlowe, I am proud of bringing two persons of such merit together that only want to know, to esteem each other. Now for meeting my modest gentleman with a demure face and quite in his own manner. I'm glad of your safe arrival, sir. I'm told you had some accidents, by the way. Only a few, madam. Yes, we had some. Yes, madam, a good many accidents. But should be sorry, madam. Or rather glad of any accidents that are so agreeably concluded. <clears throat> Never spoke so well in your whole life. Keep it up and I'll ensure you the victory. I'm afraid you flatter, sir. You that have seen so much of the finest company can find little entertainment in an obscure corner of the country. <laughs> I have lived, indeed, in the world, madam. But I've kept very little company. I've been but an observer upon life, madam, while others were enjoying it. But that, I am told, is the way to enjoy it at last. Cicero never spoke better. Once more, and you are confirmed in assurance forever. Stand by me, then, and when I'm down, throw in a word or two to set me up again. An observer like you upon life were, I fear, disagreeably employed, since you must have had much more to censure than approve. Pardon me, madam. I was always willing to be amused. The folly of most people is rather an object of mirth than uneasiness. Oh, brother, you never spoke so well in your whole life. Well, Miss Hardcastle, I see that you and Mr. Marlowe are going to be very good company. I believe our being here will but embarrass the interview. Not in the least, Mr. Hastings. We like your company, of all things. George, sure you won't go. How can you believe us? Our presence will but spoil conversation, so we'll retire inside. You don't consider, man, that we have to manage a little tete-a-tete -tete of our own. <laughs> Holy an observer, I presume, sir. The ladies, I should hope, have employed some part of your dresses. Pardon me, madam, I... I... I, as yet, have studied only to deserve them. And that, some say, is the very worst way to obtain them. Perhaps so, madam. But I love to converse only with the grave and sensible part of the sex. But I'm afraid I grow tiresome. Oh, not at all, sir. There's nothing I like so much as grave conversation myself. I could hear it forever. Indeed, I've often been surprised how a man of sentiment could ever admire those light, airy pleasures where nothing reaches the heart. It's a disease of the mind, madam. In the variety of tastes, there must be some who, wanting a relish for... Um, uh, um. I understand you, sir. There must be some who, wanting a relish for refined pleasures, pretend to despise what they are incapable of tasting. My meaning, madam, but infinitely better expressed. And I can't help observing 
Uh, you were going to observe, sir? I was observing, madam. I protest, madam, I forget what I was going to observe. I know, and so do I. You were observing, sir, that in this age of hypocrisy, something about hypocrisy, sir? Yes, madam. In this age of hypocrisy, there are few who, upon strict inquiry, do not... Uh, um, uh, I understand you perfectly, sir. You got, and that's more than I do myself. You mean that in this hypocritical age, there are few that do not condemn in public what they practice in private, and think they pay every debt to virtue when they praise it? True, madam. Those who have most virtue in their mouths have least of it in their bosoms. I'm sure I tie you, madam. Not in the least, sir. There's something so agreeable and spirited in your manner. Such life and force. Pray, sir, go on. Yes, madam. I was saying that there are some occasions when a total want of courage, madam, destroys all of the and puts us upon a, a, a... Oh, I agree with you entirely. A want of courage upon some occasions assumes the appearance of ignorance and betrays us when we most want to excel. I beg you'll proceed. Yes, madam. Morally speaking, madam, But I see Miss Neville expecting us inside. I would not intrude for the world. I protest, sir. I was never more agreeably entertained in all my life. Pray go on. Yes, madam. I was... But she beckons us to join her. Madam, shall I do myself the honour to attend you? Well then, I'll follow. This pretty smooth dialogue is done for me. Was there ever such a sober, sentimental interview? <laughs> I'm certain he scarce looked in my face the whole time. Yet the fellow, but for his unaccountable bashfulness, is pretty well too. He has good sense, but then so buried in his fears that it fatigues one more than ignorance. If I could teach him a little confidence, it would be doing somebody that I know of a piece of service. But who is that somebody? That faith is a question I can scarce answer. What do you follow me for, Cousin Con? I wonder you're not ashamed to be so very engaging. I hope, Cousin, one may speak to one's relations and not be to blame. Aye, but I know what sort of relation you want to make me, though. But it won't do. I tell you, Cousin Con, it won't do. So I'll beg you keep your distance. I want no near relationship. <laughs> well, I vow, Mr. Hastings, you are very entertaining. And there's nothing in the world I love to talk of so much as London and the fashions, though I was never there myself. Never there? <laughs> you amaze me. Well, from your air and manner, I concluded you had been bred all your life, either at Ranelagh, St. James's, or Tower Wharf. <laughs> <laughs> You're only pleased to say so. <laughs> we country persons can have no manner at all. I'm in love with the town, and that serves to raise me above some of our neighbouring rustics. <laughs> but who can have a manner that has never seen the Pantheon, the, the Grotto Gardens, the, the Borough, or such places where the nobility chiefly resort? All I can do is to enjoy London at second hand. I, I, I take care to know every tete-a-tete -tete from the scandalous magazine <laughs> and have all the fashions as they come out in a letter from the two Miss Ricketts of Crooked Lane. Uh, pray, how do you like this, the head 
Mr. Hastings. <laughs> Extremely elegant and degagé, upon my word, madam. Your friseur is a Frenchman, I suppose. A protest. I dressed it myself from a print in the lady's memorandum book for the last year. Indeed. <laughs> Such a head in a side box at the playhouse would draw as many gazers as my lady mayoress at a city ball. Yeah, I vow. Since inoculation began, there's no such thing to be seen as a plain woman. So one must dress a little particular, or one may escape in the crowd. <laughs> but that can never be your case, madam, in any dress. <laughs> Yet, what signifies me dressing when I have such a piece of antiquity by my side as Mr. Hardcastle? All I can say would never argue down a single button from his clothes. I've often wanted him to throw off his great flaxen wig and where he was bald to plaster it over like my Lord Pateley with powder. You are right, madam. For as among the ladies there are none ugly, so among the men there are none old. And yet what do you think his answer was? Why, with his usual gothic vivacity, he said I only wanted him to throw off his wig to convert it into a set for my own wearing. Intolerable. Mm. At your age, you may wear what you please, and it must become. Pray, Mr. Hastings, what do you take to be the most fashionable age about town? Some time ago, 40 was all the mode, but I'm told the ladies intend to bring up 50 for the ensuing winter. Seriously? Then I shall be too young for the fashion. No lady begins now to put on jewels till she's past 40. For instance, Miss there, in a polite circle, would be considered as a child, as a mere maker of samplers. And yet, Mrs. Niece thinks herself as much a woman and is as fond of jewels as the oldest of us all. <laughs> Your niece, is she? And that young gentleman, a brother of yours, I should presume. <laughs> it's my son, sir. They are contracted to each other. Observe their little sports. <laughs> they fall in and out ten times a day as if they were man and wife already. <laughs> Why, Tony, child, what soft things are you saying to your cousin Khan since this evening? I have been saying no soft things, but that it's very hard to be followed about so. <laughs> he can't have not a place in the house now that's left to myself but the stable. Don't mind him, Khan, my dear. He's in another story behind your back. There's something generous in my cousin's manner. He falls out before faces to be forgiven in private. <laughs> That's a damn confounded crack. Uh, uh, he's a sly one. <laughs> Don't you think they are like each other about the mouth, Mr. Hastings? <laughs> the blinking sub mouth to a T. <laughs> They're of a size, too. Back to back, my pretties, that Mr. Hastings may see you. Come, Tony. Do not thank me, I tell you. Oh! Lord! You've almost cracked my head! Oh, the monster! For shame, Tony, you're a man and behave so. If I'm a man, let me have my fortune. He can't, I'll not be made a fool of no longer.